Welcome to another episode of Reflections, the Wisdom of Edgar Cayce. And my name is Peter Woodbury, and today we are going to be interviewing Robert Shore. And I am pleased to say that I believe that Robert and I are now friends. We've, uh, we met at the ARE Congress this year, the uh, summer of 2017, and I've been able to uh, visit with him when I was in New York uh, recently. And uh, Robert had the, uh, the rare uh, opportunity to have had a life reading from Edgar Cayce as a, as a young, I think he was uh, about 14 years old when he received that reading. And it was uh, profoundly influential in his life. And today we'll be exploring that experience and what's uh, unfolded since then. And this, the theme of Robert came into this life in New York uh, born a Jew and has, uh, with his experience in the reading, has had to reconcile his Jewish faith with experiences with Jesus. So I'm looking forward to this conversation with him and I'm sure you'll find many of these uh, aspects uh, interesting and intriguing as well. Thank you. So uh, Bob, it's, uh, it's a real honor and privilege to be speaking with you today. I uh, met you at this year's uh, ARE Congress, and I really enjoyed your presentation. You had so much uh, to share. I remember particularly you spoke about the, uh, the OM and kind of the, the intention behind that and the spiritual purposes and meanings of that. So I'm really looking forward to uh, having this conversation with you. Okay, well, you got the right guy because I'm really hip on, uh, on OM. Uh, at, at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis, um, I think in the first couple of pages, God makes a, uh, a statement that, you know, he's, he's creating animals and mankind and the earth and, and, and he's doing all his creating. And he says, um, uh, I have, essentially he says, I have put a piece of my spirit in every newborn child to give them a soul. So he's identifying this sliver of his consciousness being put in every newborn baby and withdrawn, obviously, when they die. So the coming and the going of God's spirit, which Jesus referred to as the, the water of life. Mm -hmm. So he starts human life, human soul growth in the infant, uh, the newborn, and when your time has come, that is removed. But that, that spark of Peter or Bob goes on as the into the interbetween, does whatever they do there, visits some interesting planets or whatever, <laughs> and then comes back to Earth when there's the attraction of um, problems or solutions that need to be addressed uh, as part of the evolution of the soul. And then you're born and that the infant is activated by the Spirit of God. And I think, I'm just stumbling here but I think that that is what uh, Casey referred to when he said that you uh, have the aerial force A-E-R-I-A-L mm -hmm. and I could never understand what well, the aerial that's, that's like you receive radio messages mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. well I discovered that the ohm is your telephone line with God mm. because it is part of God mm -hmm. and what happens is that the ohm in sound expresses every vibration in your body it's complete mm -hmm. oh and you're listening to every cell in my body's vibration and wow okay but then there's a level where the sound goes up and up. I'm thinking of my mind and the sound goes up by itself. Oh, 
becomes a healing force because the mind is the builder. Mm -hmm. And you, Casey said somewhere, the mind can rebuild the whole body. So, but then there's a level above that, which is the spiritual level, the uh, the contact with God, the sliver of life force that God gave to each one of us while we're alive, it's there. And it, it's, what a, what a neat system. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's um, a... So when you ohm, and you do you, 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 you so there are two there are two tasks that God has given human beings directly not not religious figures speculating on what you know the true relationship with God is there's a uh, I think it's in Genesis 12 God it, it opens with God talking to Abraham and saying Listen, I got a deal here. I mean, basically what he was saying was, I, I have a deal here. I want you to work for me. You know, famous words. I want you to work for me. I even had a vision in this life where where Jesus came to me and said, I want you to work for me. Mm. And um, of course, that kind of upset me when I was Jewish. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not so Jewish now. I am Jewish. You know, it's the genes. Yeah. This is an ancient line of uh, genetic inheritance. And um, there's a whole family going back with psychic, so. Yeah. Um, well, let me let that, that our, our watchers and listeners know that, um, that you had, how many readings did you have from Edgar Cayce? You had one, one reading. And then, one reading. why he didn't died you? died a few later. Oh. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that reading and kind of the impact it's had over your life? Oh, well, the impact. You know, it was a burden for a long time mm -hmm. because uh, he said he said things I didn't understand and misinterpreted. Mm -hmm. How old were you when you got the reading? I was 14. Uh -huh. It was... Uh, I don't know, March or April of 2000, who was this, 1945 mm -hmm. uh, or 44, one or the That's other. That's right, because he passed away in, uh, in January of 45. 45, right. Mm -hmm. He gave this reading April something mm -hmm. in 44. Mm -hmm. And then he, he got sick again. He, mm -hmm. he was worn out. He yeah. Over, and... Uh, I haven't seen him in a long time. Mm -hmm. And um, so. So you were saying that the, the reading was kind of confusing. It took you a while to kind of wrestle with it. Yeah, thanks for refreshing it. Yeah. The brain is getting old. Mm -hmm. I'm not, but the brain is getting old. And um, it's a, it's a, it's something that I felt obliged and wanting both at the same time, mm -hmm. both free will and not free will, to, to uh, follow the instructions in the reading. And um, what were some of those instructions? What were some of the highlights that, that, well, the, that, that you wrestled with? Okay, on the astrological side, it said, oh, you could be a, a, somebody who gives lectures on art or music. Uh, you should make that part of your life. Um, uh, you have the universal consciousness, a word I didn't, words I didn't understand. Um, you have, um, and he, he went through uh, Venus and uh, love, you got love there. And um, Jupiter, you have the universal consciousness. Mars gives you endless en energy. Mm -hmm. uh, things like that. Mm -hmm. And it says you could become a lecturer. You could become uh, a writer. You you you. You good? Yeah, I'm sorry. They they were uh, just asking they if were, I if I needed a glass of water. 
Oh, I see. I think we asked you if you were still alive. Uh, and then it's barrage. All right, so both of us are still alive. Yes. Yeah, so and you're saying so you got you got this astrological America. you got this astrological kind of information. Right. And I didn't realize till just a few months ago, there's another article in Venture and in Inwood, a, a magazine I do do recommend to people to read, not just to adore, but to mm -hmm. read it. And uh, I, I, what can I say? I am tone deaf. Mm -hmm. I have no future in the music field at mm -hmm. all. It, these things don't, uh, you know, I can't tell one note from another. On the other hand, I became the chief baritone horn player in the high school band. Uh -huh. And he switched me from first trumpet to second trumpet to tuba to baritone horn, and I played all those. And uh, for the graduation ceremony, he gave, he gave me the... Uh, um, the baritone horn and said, you play the solo. This is the guy who was running the, uh, there was uh, about 30 people in the high school band. And so I played the, uh, the baritone horn at the uh, graduations. And I don't have any musical ability at all. Mm -hmm. So how did mean, you pull that off? I fooled them. Uh -huh. I don't know. Um, I'd been studying the trumpet for five years. My mother insisted that I take uh, and learn a musical instrument. And so I learned the trumpet and uh, and uh, ended up in the band in my uh, sophomore year or something like that. And I played in the band. And... Uh, I did it by counting exactly how many beats, so I knew when to, uh, get, to uh, come in. Yeah. Right. I didn't listen to the music because I couldn't remember one yeah. note from another. I mean, there's no, there's nothing in here. Yeah. That musical. So and math, I, math saved you. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, now, was that at all referenced in the reading? Was there anything about the importance of music, or was that just that you you had yeah. this ability to overcome obstacles? Yeah, I said you should study music, um, and then he said you can lecture because of some other astrological stuff. Of course, recently I read something, which uh, in a reading where he said, you know. Um, uh, you do your best in life, you know, you can't, you know, the, the, the most important, I think, is essentially, he was saying the most important 80% of your personality is from your prior lives, mm -hmm. not from the astrological mm -hmm. influence. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you're shaking your head. So I assume you, you agree with that. Mm -hmm. And um, the there were four lives that he gave, right? Uh -huh. So, uh, I just, there's some wonderful stories about that because I kept trying to, in college to take some subjects that would fit me for the a astrological. And I completely ignored the past lives because I didn't know what to do with them. And it's, it's there was no manual, no book. How how do you follow the past lives that a Casey reading provided you? Mm -hmm. Where's the book? <laughs> there is no book. You have to figure it out. Oh, I can't figure this out. And it was baffling. And I felt totally incompetent. To now, now, your family had gotten many readings. So, so your family well, had a, a lot of credibility I, in Edgar Casey. Well... No, no. Well, my mother started reading Edgar Casey material when I was ten years old, and when she got done reading the monthly bulletins that she got, because they were uh, bulletins sent out with excerpts from readings, 
and she gave me those after she read them and I read them and my mind divided and said, well, you know, this is really Christian. Uh, that's not me. I want to be a rabbi. Mm -hmm. And um, then I created a lot of confusion in that way. Um, but uh, that's that's where I first and then the book uh, book came out. There is a river. And that kind of was an eye opener. So, so um, your parents didn't have readings. So you got a reading no, on your own. I had a reading on my own. So you wrote to you wrote to the ARE and no, said. No, no, my mother coughed up the thirty-five dollars and sent in the request for the whole, each person in the family. Oh, the whole family. So how many were in your family? Uh, well, four. Four. So he gave he, he gave your mom, your dad, and you, and you have a brother. And I have a brother. And well, so the four of you got a reading. If, no. No, what happened was that it was just at the time he was getting mortally sick. Oh. And when I was in Virginia Beach, they took me to the record room where our file, our family file is, a in the vault. And uh, there was a letter from my mom that I did not understand, know existed. Oh. Which she wrote, I understand, Mr. Casey, that you're sick. And... Uh, I am slated for the first family reading, and I want to turn it over to Bob. He needs it more than I do. Ah. So how I got the reading was this generous thing from my mother. So you're the only one who got a reading in your family? Only one. Ah. Ah. And so you found out while you were here, you saw that letter from your mother that you didn't know about. That's right. How moving. Well, it really was. I yeah. kind of choked up. Yeah. Um, but she she became very active and got to know you, Lynn, pretty well and used to come to the Congresses. And, um, you know, I was struggling with the, well, I'm Jewish and he's Christian and you know, what is this about Jesus and how can he be God and also a human being at the same time? And... Um, and you know that what the high priest did in Jerusalem was to um, excommunicate him, basically. Say, well, you're a blasphemer and therefore you're no longer Jewish. However, in that po political situation in Jerusalem in the year 30 mm -hmm. AD, the Jews had been conquered a century before that by the Romans. That that area of Israel had been conquered by the Romans. But the Romans were a peculiar people in the religious area, and they much revered ancient religions. They had a big thing. Oh, if you had a religion for a few hundred years or thousand years, uh, you had a special place in our heart. You're good people, whatever the religion is. Uh -huh. I said, it doesn't matter to us, is that you have your religion, and we respect that. And they gave the Jews all kinds of benefits, reduced their taxes, um, gave them local control of their uh, politics and uh, development. And along comes Jesus, and he's saying, no, the priesthood here, the Jewish rabbis are phony because they're charging uh, the Jewish people a big fee in order to worship God because the uh, ultra-Orthodox had closed down all temples in Israel except the one in Jerusalem. And so all the Jews had to come every year to the temple in Jerusalem and pay an enormous fee in order to buy a cow or a sheep or some kind of uh, uh, sacrifice mm -hmm. and that money went to the priesthood mm -hmm. and kept the temple going mm -hmm. Jesus comes on the scene and says that's not fair these are working people they're extremely poor they're peasants how can you charge them to worship God if that's in the Bible mm -hmm. and they said oh well you know you're a bad one <laughs> You're interfering with our. I didn't say it out loud. You're bad for business. 
you're bad for business, so we're going to excommunicate you. You claim that you are God? Oh, boy, you're out. There's only one God. You're not it. Mm -hmm. uh, you're no longer Jewish. Mm -hmm. And immediately that changed Jesus' political status. He was no longer protected by the uh, uh, Roman exemption for Jews from crucifixion oh. and from a lot of taxes that they oh. applied in all the regions they conquered. And um, I see. So he became a commoner. He lost became, his. Yeah, yeah. You know, a, a savage. Mm -hmm. or a, a, and they turned him over to the Roman court. It's not ours. You judge him. Mm -hmm. And the Roman court said, oh, kill him. You know, that's what we do with non-Jews. Mm -hmm. Anybody who gives us any kind of worry, we kill him. That's it. Crucify the guy. And that's how he got up on that, uh, that cross. And uh, that's the political side of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think most people don't understand that. Uh, you got to be a very very interested in history to come up with that little yeah I didn't know that myself yeah well you see um, history has been one of my major interests I see and I love it to this day if I need relaxation I go and pick out a history book um, so how did that how did all this um did this help you kind of reconcile your relationship with Jesus? Just kind of this understanding yeah. better his, his well, what yes, he was it, trying it, to do? It did. Yeah. Right. But um, <clears throat> actually what did the trick was that when I was 17, I was very depressed um, because I couldn't follow the reading. Mm -hmm. I really you know like I'm a nut job on on uh, <laughs> on doing what I'm told to do <laughs> and I couldn't do it because a, I didn't have the musical ability I didn't have the art ability and uh, and what what do all these four lives mean I have it the faintest notion because I had no practical experience in life yes I mean, and so this, this was 19 1950s there was no new age movement really yeah, none. Mm -hmm. So, so I really felt defeated, and I was 17, and uh, and and I called out to God and I said, "Look, look, you know, send me a savior of your choice, because I, I am on the road to demolition." Mm -hmm. And Jesus showed up. He was the person that God chose to send to help me. What a surprise. And he, he, he approached me and he took me into his heart. I vanished into his heart. I came out as behind him and I was out in space standing on the universe, which was like a flat table left and right. And there I was alone. He didn't come with me. He just put me out there and I looked up and the noonday sun was shining over my head. And I looked to the left and the other end of the universe, the universe is flat like a table. The other end of the universe, the rising sun. Oh, I said, look at that gorgeous rising sun. And then I looked to my right and I saw the setting sun going down, up and down and overhead, noon. Dawn, noon, twilight, it can't be. How can it be three suns? Can't be three suns, there's only one sun. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, I said, I am gonna run towards the rising sun because I want to live long. If I run to the setting sun, I'm cutting short my life. So I ran and ran and ran, got exhausted, I was sweaty in this vision, mm -hmm. right? I'm sweating. <sighs> I get my breath back and you know what? I look up and this, 
the noonday sun is right over my head, and far <laughs> off to the left, rising sun, mm-hmm. far off to the right, setting sun. I haven't gotten anywhere, and I ran like the speed of light. Yeah. I, I got I got to do it again. I I can't accept this. I run and run and run and run and run towards the rising sun. Ah, oh, oh, I'm gonna make it this time. Uh, I'm doing a lot of exercise, and I finally really tired. I stop. Guess what? The same thing. The, the rising sun is far away, exactly as it had been when this whole vision thing started. Overhead was the noonday sun, and off to my right was the setting sun. And that's when I learned the thing that uh, showed up in the uh, in the venture engine, all time is, is one time. And God lives in all those times. He is, he is universal. Mm-hmm. Beginning, middle and end is all inside God's head. He's aware of everything. And and he, and Jesus was exposing me to that reality mm-hmm. as the cure for my depression, I think, because the minute I understood what was going on, I was back in my body and the depression was gone. I was healed. Mm. And uh, So somehow your depression was kind of existential. Yeah. And so this this kind of uh, gave you that perspective that it helped you. gave perspective to, to deal with the fact uh, that life is life. And if you don't understand this and this in your reading, uh, that doesn't make you a bad person because you are dealing with past, present, and future like everybody else. So why don't you just deal with today? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I said, oh, that, that's hopeful. Well, look at that. <laughs> what a smart guy he is. Uh-huh. Well, that started our friendship right there. And so then, how, so over time, how did, you, how, how did you reconcile your Jewish faith with a relationship with Jesus? Well, um, today I consider him a Jewish prophet. Mm-hmm. Who wasn't I, accepted at the time. Huh? Who, who was not accepted. accepted. Yeah. Was, yeah. And further than that, I accept him as a guy with a IQ of a million. Mm-hmm. He is the smartest guy you can imagine. Mm-hmm. Because when I read the New Testament, you see all these wonderful things that he's talking about. Like he wrote the guidebook, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just incredible. Uh because as the years went by, uh, my own psychic capacity kicked in. And when I read the Bible, I get all kinds of information that nobody else has gotten. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I read the text and I understand what they're saying in reality. Mm-hmm. For instance, um, in the early pages, of the Bible, they, they talk about um, God punishing the, uh, the the people in Sodom and Gomorrah because he was really angry at them and he brought this fire out of the sky. And I said, you know, that's totally inconsistent with God's nature. Mm-hmm. Jesus said that the most God will do is if you move away from God, he'll move away from you. It's reciprocal. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's in a reading. That's what God does. He, he doesn't harm you. He just says, well, you're not looking for my companionship, so I'm not going to look for yours. And he moves away. And it's really like looking in a mirror, right? It's it's. Mm-hmm. Well, it is like a mirror because we have this hunk of God inside us, and God has his own hunk of God. <laughs> <laughs> and... If I spurn God, that gets reversed in the mirror, and he spurns me. Mm -hmm. He says, well, you're walking away from me. Uh, You're creating an image of me where I'm walking away from you. You you know, you're just fooling yourself. But you want it, you got it. 
And so that kind of straightened out my relationship with the Lord. Mm -hmm. And it's a Casey, a Casey statement somewhere in the reading mm -hmm. that um, we, uh, that God is reciprocal. Mm -hmm. So if you approach God, that he approaches you. So that's how you get close to God. Is you get off your ass and you move towards God, he moves towards you. And then in, in, the, in the early pages of the Bible, out of the blue, uh, God appears to Abraham and he says, look, buddy, um, I got this deal. I want to work with you. Mm -hmm. Not in so many words, but mm -hmm. that's what happens. He says, I have this deal. Um, let's make a contract. What I want from you is that you move closer to me. So that means you got to leave uh, the Middle East and travel a thousand miles to Israel and be with me. Uh, that'll that'll bring you close to me. And Abraham immediately after this this is a, and he says, if you do that, I will guide you on the way and protect you from robbers and thieves and so on. And then God says, well, but the second provision is that. Um, you have to be a blessing to all the families in the world. And if you do that, I'll make sure that your descendants uh, will inherit your lands and you will have left uh, a, a, a big family as you have prayed to me that you want. Mm -hmm. I'll give you that. That's a gift. Mm -hmm. And third, um, if people curse you, I will curse them on your behalf. And if people help you, I'll help them on your behalf. And that's my contract. What are you going to do? And Abraham, there's nothing said in the Bible about what Abraham said, but it does continue. Abraham packs up all his goods, his family, his relatives that he wants to take and leaves and walks a thousand miles to Israel, overshoots, misses, misses God, ends up in Egypt temporarily, doesn't do so well there, comes back to, to Israel and uh, finds God at last, physically. I mean, you know, he sets up a, uh, a stone uh, altar mm -hmm. and the that those three provisions move closer to me and be a blessing to everybody and train your descendants to be a blessing to everybody and we're going to be great friends and I'm going to do all kinds of nice things for you so that was the deal God offered Abraham accepted and he begins to lead this incredible life with a lot of adventures. And, uh, and then he gives birth to, uh, finally, both to the, well, it, it's a complicated story. Mm -hmm. It goes on and on. Yeah. But anyhow, uh, he obeyed. He did his best. And so and, has that been a model for you? And yes. Is that your, yeah. And then how yeah. does that, how did you, how does Jesus fit in there for you? Well, um, actually in the readings it says that Jesus was a grandson of Abraham mm -hmm. in the incarnation as one of the 12 children of Jacob or something mm -hmm. like that. And then they sell Joseph, his name was Joseph in that life. They, uh, they wanted to kill him. His brothers were jealous of his psychic ability. They wanted to kill him. And uh, they ship him off to Egypt uh, as a kindness. And he becomes a big, big political figure in Egypt. It saves them from a vast uh, famine and uh, re 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 reunites with his family and his father. And the, the Jews spent 500 years in Egypt. And uh, by the time the 500 years is up, they're slaves. 
And so God makes a deal with Moses, and he goes and rescues the Hebrews mm -hmm. from from Egypt. Mm -hmm. And the minute he gets them free, they turn and they make this golden calf idol to worship. They've been Egyptians for 500 years. They forgot all about the land of Israel. Uh, they've forgotten all about Abraham. They've forgotten about law and order. They uh, all do what they're told. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're kind of nasty people. And so it takes him 30 or 40 years to straighten them out, bring law. And he's very um, organized, uh, but also vindictive to those who cross, his, cross him. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and that's the nature of the Jewish orthodoxy to this day. Mm -hmm. that they, they follow the pattern of religion of Moses because that really was the second birth of the Jewish nation mm -hmm. when they came out from Egypt. He had to retrain them, and he, he, he hired priests, and he, and he did whatever he had to do and uh, turned them into an army which was run by a fellow named Joshua, I believe. The reading says was a reincarnation of Jesus. Yes. And then Jesus took them and actually did a lot of killing yeah. of the natives, and they recaptured the land of Israel. But Moses didn't go. Mm -hmm. It wasn't part of that victory. And if you can call it a victory. Mm -hmm. and, um, well, we've wandered, haven't we? Well, that, uh, <laughs> we can be found again. And so this, well, so, so from, so you said you were 17 when you had your first encounter with Jesus and then you, yeah. this continued and he, he's become kind of a, I don't know, a guide or an elder brother for you in this path. And so you've, you've kind yeah. of figured out a way to, to, uh, because he was, uh, he was out of the Jewish tradition and maybe he, he wasn't, he was rejected, but I think that you're seeing through why he was rejected and that he yeah. had an important uh, role to play in, uh, in, in helping history. us. Yes. And in the future for Jews. Yes. So, and for the world, because um, he's coming back. I had a vision in my mid-years um, that I really don't like the Twelve Apostles. Mm -hmm. They are the brothers who ditched Joseph. Mm -hmm. And I just can't, can't get cozy with them. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then if you read the New Testament, you see that at the Last Supper, none of them get upset that he's been turned over to the Romans and is going to be killed. That's really apparent to all of them. Mm -hmm. and they, they don't say a word. That he says, come in the garden and pray with me. They go to the garden and immediately lie down on the ground and pretend to be asleep. The Bible says they slept. I don't think they slept. I think they knew and had agreed to the plan of uh, Judas, mm. just the way uh, they had agreed to ditch Joseph. Mm -hmm. right? It was a replay of the same uh, thing. Let's get rid of this guy. Uh, Twelve brothers conniving. Uh, a few of them wanted to kill him. A few of them said no. They dickered it out, and they uh, uh, they didn't kill him, but they sold him to slavery. Mm -hmm. So in this case. Um, they allowed him to be killed, right? They fulfilled their mission. Ah. And uh, so in this vision, I walked into a, we have a beautiful industrial building here in Westchester, and a beautiful garden. And, um, and we visit there every once in a while just to see the beauty of it. And in this vision, I am walking into their headquarters building in this giant park. And, um, yeah, I don't want to answer that. That's okay. You can let it ring. 
We good. So, uh, so you were in this, you said this, this beautiful vision. building. Yeah. So I, I walk in, there's paintings on the wall, go to the back, go down a, a, a stairway to the basement. It's a cafeteria. Mm -hmm. And I turn and I go to this glass door and I, and I make a left turn and there's a big table and there are 12 men sitting around the table eating and laughing and joking. And I, I don't want to deal with these guys. I don't like them. And I walk right past them. I could have sat and ate with yeah. them. Didn't want to do that in the dream, mm -hmm. in the vision. So I go and then I make a left turn and go out the rear door, another glass, and I push it open and I'm out in the garden and I'm walking down a small hill and I come to a larger space of grass, an enormous field, which in fact is, is there for this building. Mm -hmm. And way off to the left, I see people dancing in, in this vision. I see them dancing and saying, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And I'm watching this and watching this. And finally it occurs to me to be curious, what in the world are they doing? Mm -hmm. And the minute that thought crossed my mind, what are they doing? Two men come out from the crowd and come running up the, the side hill to me and they say, well, we're going to tell you what they're doing. They've heard that, that, that uh, Mary has reincarnated in this world, in this time. And they're just so happy about that. And they're singing hallelujah and they're, they're just going bananas. And they said further, Jesus is coming also. He will incarnate in the future. See that trail going down there into the distance? He's going to come along that trail, and he'll be here. Wow. So you, being younger than me, are going to live to see that. Oh, you think it's going to happen in this, this time frame? This space of time, yeah. yeah. I think Mary's already incarnated. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was for 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. So I think that she has already had time to incarnate. She's somewhere on the planet. Uh -huh. And um, I think as soon as she's an adult and has a baby, it's going to be Jesus. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good news. We yes, sure could use some help. <laughs> ah, but you will remember, you would remember, you will remember that, that Jesus said, oh, there's bad times coming. The end of days, prepare. I'll be back. Yeah. And I so I think he's talking about climate warming. Yeah. And he knows about climate warming because the spark of God in each of us has the total consciousness of God. It is a piece of God. Mm -hmm. Whatever God knows, you know inside you. Wow, all right. So God knows about climate warming. This is before it became a popular thing. Right. Jesus knew about it. I do believe he's, he's predicting dire things. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, Mr. Casey had this conversation with Gladys. And I don't know where I heard it, but I heard it down there. She said to him, oh, I, uh, I'd, I'd like to uh, incarnate soon. And he said, no, you, don't, you really don't want to do that. Things are going to be awful here on Earth. Stay, when, you, when you pass on, stay away. <laughs> and I, I think I heard that from her as, 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 because she and I were good friends. Yeah. I worked down there two or three years. Oh, and the boy the, the board of directors refused to hire me. Why and is that? I, why? Yeah. I'm Jewish. Ah. Uh. I think. I mean, nobody explained it. Yulin went to them, he said. He went to them and proposed that 
they hire me? They said no. I so, recall from the, uh, I think it's in the work readings, that Edgar Casey talked about a Jew joining or the, the need for a Jew to come into the team and that that was going to uh, benefit the organization. Oh, well, could have been me or there were maybe they hadn't. Pictures. Maybe they hadn't read it. They weren't, you know, the, uh, <laughs> the readings weren't so accessible then. You know, yeah. now we have work reading groups where we try to, to study what Edgar Casey talked about, how to, how to make the most out of these, this work. Well, that's a good to have that kind of group going. Because yeah. Um, with the OM, they will have celestial information, mm -hmm. or they will have uh, information from a higher level. Mm -hmm. So when I read the Bible, I, I see things in there that nobody else has seen. For instance, um, you know, this Presbyterian priest in England who added up all the lives and said, oh, the earth's only been around 4,000 years. Mm -hmm. He added up the life space of all these things. Pure fiction. Mm -hmm. He came up with 4,000 years, and now that's a big thing in the Protestant and Catholic religion. Oh, that's, that's part of their concept. And, uh, well, we know scientifically that that's not conceivable. Mm -hmm. um, but but uh, the universe is still there with or without Christianity and with or without Judaism. Yes. Whatever. Um, and God, all time is one time. God stretches like that universe that Jesus deposited me on. It's all one. And in the higher realm in which God exists, there is no beginning and end to, to his knowledge because all information is instantaneously distributed throughout mm -hmm. that level. Mm -hmm. And that happens on Earth in certain laboratory experiments where they uh, put a pool of... Uh, uh, a mercury, and they heat it or cool it, or they do, do something, they change it. I think they cool it to where it's almost zero, 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 right? Mm -hmm. Totally cold. And at that point, it uh, information that's put in the puddle of mercury by the scientists is instantly everywhere in the puddle. Doesn't mm -hmm. take time for the information to circulate. Mm -hmm. It's in this part, it's in all parts. And I think that's what the, the mind of God is, is like that, is everything is instantaneous. Mm -hmm. um, we're not on that level. Mm -hmm. but, but we have a piece of God in us that is on that level because it is part of that mind. Mm -hmm. And that's why we can talk to God and why he can hear us. And so that's where the meditation and the om come in to, to right. access that. Otherwise, okay. otherwise we're like a television set that's not, doesn't, not, not using its antenna. Right, yeah. exactly, you got it. That's it, that's, that's what it is. And so, um, well, we're gonna we're gonna wrap up. I mean, it's um, the, the, we're almost at the end of the hour. We're gonna have to have you back, but we have a little bit of time. I understand you're you've been working on a book about Edgar Casey, and I assume about all this kind of spiritual learning that you've had in your life. Yeah. What, what 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 would you? What are some of the themes that you're you're uh, putting into the book? You're exploring. Uh -huh. Well, um, I finished the the rough copy mm -hmm. a year ago, and and I haven't haven't been back to it. So you asked me the theme, but generally it's in this direction that we've been talking about, oh, mm -hmm. and I'm adding the the stuff that I now know about our P 
peace of God in us, uh-huh. which gives us access to God. So uh, just for your audience and you and mm-hmm. me mm-hmm. together, because I benefit when I benefit somebody else. Mm-hmm. Do you know that? Yes, that's mm-hmm. true. We're all one through that peace of God. Yes. We're all connected and whatever I know, you know, at that level. Because yes. it runs through the God part and it's all over yes. the universe. I remember it in, in, in a reading, because I do a lot of work with hypnosis, Casey says that all subconscious minds are connected. Ah, there you go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's the same thing. Mm-hmm. They are connected. Yeah. So, uh, you know, welcome, brother. <laughs> Go. Oh, it's been. Uh, I've enjoyed our our conversation, and um, I think we're going to have to have a part two. We're going to have to. I think our listeners and and viewers are going to want to hear more from you. So, uh, I'll share the I'll share the good news that comes to us because it might be that impetus to get that book done. I know what it's like to to be kind of writing and writing in a vacuum, and sometimes it's nice to to get uh, some resonance from from the audience about. Uh, the importance of it. Well, but I know that, it. I do know that when you spoke here at Congress, that you had our attention. And it's, you know, some of the, sometimes the Casey stuff gets into the little bit of the phenomena and the fluff about it. And I thought you went right to the core and right to the depth of it and the, the personal spiritual growth and relationship. And so I, I would certainly encourage you to get that out there right. and I'm talking yeah. to myself too because I'm also working on my book too so <laughs> well, you know, what's the subject wouldn't relate to Casey yeah it's related to Casey it's I think it's um it's at different times I've thought about the the Jesus material fascinates me and some of the work that I've been doing with uh, trance states and getting into people's subconscious connections and the incredible kind of things that uh, happen these visions that that people happen I, I think that um it's easier and easier now with the new age to access these transcendent states of consciousness. And so, so people don't need to, to use drugs and do this other kind of stuff. They, they can much easier uh, you know, access spiritual reality. You know, see, I think that we get so um, disconnected that life has no meaning when, when there's not a, a, a spiritual purpose to it. And so I, I, I'm gonna be writing about encouraging people to, to turn within and that you know every day that you wait it's easier you know tomorrow's going to be easier to access because we're just coming into that that uh the thinning of the veil that Casey uh predicts well i think you got it because uh that's that's what happens is uh we we live in a society where there's so many distressed people mm-hmm. and uh so as a, what I could close with is to say, listen, you know what? What it, the Lord's Prayer is really excellent. I mean, uh, Jesus was a genius. Mm-hmm. Starts out, "Our Father." It's not Peter's father, it's not Bob's father. It's our Father. Every human being has that one Father. That's the spiritual level, mm-hmm. and He has gifted us with his connection he said well you're not alone you know I'm there you can choose what you want but I'm there if you need me and if you spurn me I'll back off when you back off you know and no 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 hard feelings <laughs> but I won't be around for you mm-hmm. so so close let's close on a, a brief discussion of the ohm I'm gonna ohm now, the body is all vibration, all atoms moving around. You know, the whole universe gives off a sound. Mm-hmm. It's like a D mito or something like that. Animals respond to that. Um, human beings respond uh, to music, to, you know, to, you know, so um, we're, we're, we're vibratory things if you don't vibrate you're not alive mm-hmm. it's just that uh, that's how it is mm-hmm. and um so the ohm and and it's recommended by uh by uh casey somewhere and i think the search for god books 
says, well, you know, uh, put that, uh, hang that donkey tail uh, on your donkey. Mm-hmm. Um, the arm first, right? Oh, well, if you if you're doing the arm to encompass all the vibrations of your body, the arm drops all by itself down, down until it's encompassing every single vibration in your body. Oh, and you can send that to God. Mm -hmm. Say, I'm here, God. Oh, he says, why are you here? What what are you doing? Oh, I'm glad to see you, but you know, my prodigal son. (laughs) Oh, okay. Um, You've moved closer to me. I'll move closer to you. Let's, you know. Let's have a jamboree. You know? <laughs> this is a very kind God. Mm-hmm. Um, if, on the other hand, you get involved where you want to heal somebody, right? Mm-hmm. You have to have a purpose, mm-hmm. right? The mind is the builder, but it doesn't build if you don't have a purpose to build something. Mm-hmm. So the mind role, and, and recently I saw an excerpt which said, <clears throat> The, the mind can rebuild the whole body. It is the builder. Mm-hmm. It can do that. Mm-hmm. It doesn't tell you how, but the how is this vibration mm. which connects you with God. So you're actually getting the chief surgeon in the universe on the other side, the chief, chief doctor. They go, oh. And when you, when you say, you know, God, I, I, I want to love my fellow human beings more than I love them now. Help me, help me to love. Help, help me to do that. The the own goes up in pitch. Oh, I don't push it up. Mm-hmm. It goes up because I'm thinking. Mm-hmm. I have a purpose to heal. Oh, oh. And your body feels that sensation. If I put my hand on somebody and I own oh, high and it goes high because that's my intention uh-huh. Our intention controls the pitch mm-hmm. so if your intention uh-huh. is to heal the person and I put my hand right here on your forehead I go oh. yeah I've sent you a lot of good healing. healing so yeah, he- so you fulfilled that readings promise about working with sound and vibration and music. So it was, it's been yeah. useful for you. Yeah. Yeah. Can't, All right, we're gonna, have to, we're gonna have to say uh, so long. Not goodbye, but so long. We'll pick this up uh, again in a future interview. Well, thank you so much for giving us uh, your time today. And I look forward to uh, our continued contact. Hello and welcome once again to the thought for the day. And we have Pat Belisle standing by. Hey, Pat, how are you? I'm very well, Peter. I hope you are. Yes. And what's our thought for the day? We have another Edgar Casey reading. This one is reading 1599-1. It says, For until you are willing to lose yourself in service, you may not indeed know that peace which he has promised to give to all. So there you go, man. We got to lose our ego self in service where the other person's needs are seen as important as our own. Uh, You remember that uh, mantra that Casey said, Jesus walked around all day saying in his own mind, others, Lord, others. Yes. And that's the trick to, to us getting outside of our own ego, thinking about the needs of others. Yes. Yeah, I think that we're really fortunate in that I think the two of us and, and many of us here at the ARE, that we do enjoy helping others. And it's, uh, it's good to know that I guess there's some, some levels of consciousness where it's almost like um, more self-serving. And I think that that's, uh, as we evolve, you know, uh, seeing the, the smile on someone or knowing that you've helped someone can be so, um, I don't know how to say it, how so boosting. Gratifying. So gratifying, that's a good word. 
Yeah, you bet. Yeah. No, I'm with you. Absolutely. And, you know, for me, I, I grew up Catholic and uh, and service was a big part of what we were told to, to do as Catholics. But the part that I love about Edgar Casey in the readings is that he basically says that we need to serve with joy. Yes. It needs to it needs to be really an internal, genuine motivation uh, to be of service and not just a, an obligation or an expectation. So yes. that's that's one spin that I would throw in on this particular thought of the, the day is to go out and serve with joy. Yes. I, I grew up also, my parents had a mission, you know, a statement, and it was about that we're here to help others. But I, as I grew up, it almost felt like um, it, it was like a heavy burden, like mm -hmm. there wasn't really a choice involved. And then uh, yeah. I remember a mentor kind of helping me kind of let that go for a little while. And then I got into theater. And as I explored other options, I came back to doing social work and service work. But it, it felt very different that it was a choice rather mm -hmm. than something that was uh, I had to do. And that, that made a big difference, that the feeling that I had that that power of choice. You better believe it. Yeah. Well, let's let's you and I and, and all the people watching this go out and be of joyful service today. What do you say? Sounds good. All right, man. All right. Take care. Thanks so much. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.